question. And uh, okay, so the setting for this talk is similar to the previous talk by Philip. And then, so I will spend a few minutes just uh, reviewing the setting for us. Uh, what do we want to achieve? Uh, okay, so. And so this is the practical setup. We want to uh, find a metric or a similarity measure between shapes, so curves, uh, unparameterized, uh, which has some certain nice properties, for example, which is uh, accurate, so it allows you to distinguish different uh, curves, uh, and uh, that's hopefully fast uh, to compute. <coughs> right, so our main application is to compute a motion capture, so you, you have some people moving around, put sensors on some certain body parts and uh, you record this. So this is, these are your curves, right? And the, so uh, the model is that they, these curves uh, evolve in SO3, so you have rigid motions because as you see in the diagram, you have different, uh, different sensors that, are, that are you assume to have a fixed uh, distance between each other. So for example, uh, at all times, hopefully your head is close to your upper neck and so on. And uh, so you measure the, pos the relative rotation and positions uh, which are fixed uh, with respect to this root node, which is kind of your center of mass. And then all the other positions you can compute by composing this rotation matrices and uh, having the lengths of the bones, right? So essentially your recording is a bunch of matrices in SO3, one for each joint, all right? Uh, and so given two motions uh, recorded in this way, we want to compute some kind of distance to be able to distinguish if this person is running, walking, jogging, jumping, etc. And uh, for our application, we use uh, data from the Carnegie Mellon University MOCAP database, which comes in a particular format and there's the address if you want to look at the data. Okay, so this is, this is the project. And uh, for us, uh, shapes are uh, unparameterized curves so which take values in a, in a Likud, right? So, or in this case, in a direct product of Likud. So it's also three, one for each joint. Uh, so, and we do this identification of curves uh, modular reparameterization. So which is technically taking a quotient of the immersions by the diffeomorphism group of the interval zero one, which is your time interval, all right? And you need them to be orientation preserved. Uh, so this is the setup. So for us, shapes are uh, essentially equivalent classes, modular reparameterization of parameterized curves. Okay. And so uh, how do you measure? Uh, usually the distance between two shapes is that you build a distance on this space S of shapes induced by some uh, pseudo metric on the parameterized curves which should be First, uh, reparameterization, we should be reparameterization invariant, so that it really defines a distance on the shapes. So the one of the standard choices now the, is uh, putting a Riemannian metric on the immersions, and if you do the computation, you get this distance that's, uh, that's there, which is kind of an L2 distance, which is uh, exactly this uh, elastic metric coming from measuring the distance between the these Q curves which are associated to, your original, to the original curves in the group uh, via this uh, square root velocity transform, right? So this is kind of the same setup as in the previous talk. Uh, just the particular case we are looking not only at curves and, but not surfaces or anything like that. Uh, okay. So some observations about this uh, distance, dp, which is used to induce the distance on shapes so it's only a pseudo metric because it's reparameterization invariant. So if you put, so it has a kernel, which is just the equivalence class of one fixed uh, curve. And it's, uh, as I said, it's the pullback of the usual L2 metric on the derivative of the curve. So you, you, you have your curve, you pull it back to the Lie algebra and then you measure some kind of L, L2 distance. And this is actually giving you uh, a way of, of deforming one, this one curve in the group into the other. And it measures uh, the, the effort you need to do to do this. And it's also reparameterization invariant. So when you go to the shape space, so it's project this distance, uh, you obtain uh, something defined like this and you see it's a variational problem, right? You have to compute an infimum over this infinite dimensional uh, diffeomorphism group of the interval, which is huge and uh, so this 
this is a difficult problem. And usually what is done is uh, this is solved by using some kind of uh, dynamic programming. So this, this group, this D plus is uh, discretized in some way and then you can solve this by using dynamic programming, but this can be very costly. So you have to find ways of simplifying this problem or take, taking another approach. So our approach is using what's called signatures, which were introduced by Chen in 57 uh, where he was studying uh, identif identification of curves evolving on manifolds, essentially. So he wanted to build some sort of, in sort of invariant that allowed him to distinguish curves which were evolving, uh, say, in a finite dimensional manifold. Uh, some year years later, they were used by Terry Lyons to produce some kind of universal representation of path and also of control system of affine con solutions to affine control system. So I'm not going to go into that, but uh, <coughs> this is kind of uh, the core of uh, Terry's work. So how is this signature defined? You give me a curve which is evolving in R D, and a multi-index which I like to think uh, of as words. So you give me a series of indices uh, which are telling you uh, some how the directions in which you're integrating, and then you build this SXI. So you have a, a bunch of numbers which are indexed by these multi-indices, which are just given by iterated integrals of the derivative of your curve. So you take the first in the index, you integrate up to some time, and then this gives you another curve, and then you multiply by the next derivative of the, another, uh, the second component, which is indexed by I2, <coughs> you integrate again, and so on and so forth, and you obtain this iterated integral, uh, which is a real number, right? So you have a, a family of real numbers indexed by these multi-indices, uh, I1 to IN, so N here for this example is uh, some number, but I actually you have to take all multi-indices of all sizes, so actually the signature is an infinite dimensional collection numbers indexed by this uh, capital I. So some examples of these components, how do they look? So if you look at a single index, this means you're only integrating the derivative uh, of one of the components of your path, so you get the input. So you see that having this number alone really tells you nothing about the curve. Only tell, tells you uh, where it started and where it ended. Nothing else. So there could be a million curves with the same component in the first uh, level, as it were, right? But if you look at now, at, uh, when you have a, a multi-index uh, index of, of length two, then you get something different, which is here, which depends on, on the example, but uh, you can in principle compute this, and so on and so forth. So if you have three indices now, you have a triple, a triple integral, etc., etc., and you need this whole family of iterated integrals to characterize your path. So what, what uh, are the properties of this map? So for one, it's re automatically reparameterization invariant. This is, was already proved by Chen. So if you compose your curve with a diffeomorphism of the interval, uh, orientation preserving, then you get the same collection of numbers. So, uh, so this is telling you something that it might be useful for shapes. So it characterizes actually the path up to removal of excursions, where excursion means that you go along some path and then you retrace it back exactly in the same way and you, and you end in the same spot. So you have a path, you do an excursion and then you continue, it has the same signature as just following along the path, it's keeping the excursion. Uh, and it's invertible under certain assumptions. So you can actually, if you know the signature, you can recover your path well, under certain conditions. Right. So for example, this reparameterization invariant already tells you that this might be difficult to do, right? Because if I give you a curve and you compute the signature, you already forget the, the original parameterization of your curve. Okay, so as I pointed out uh, briefly before, this representation is infinite dimensional, so you have an infinite collection of numbers, but you can actually truncate it. So you say you, uh, you compute indices uh, up to a certain fixed length. 
and uh, you can actually count how many you have to compute, uh, but you lose some information. So this representation is no longer identifying your curve. Right? As, as we saw before, if you stop at level one, then you only see the increment of the curve. So the, so the higher you go, so the more indices you take, you get a more accurate representation, but if you stop at some point and then you lose all, uh, some information. To characterize the path, you really need all. Okay, but this is not very amenable to computation, right? Because you cannot store it in a computer. So you, in practice, you have to truncate. Uh, also, there is some redundancy in these numbers because there are some relations that are satisfied. So for example, again, for these two, two index, uh, Samples here, if I were to flip J and I, I can actually rewrite it as the product of two of the, the first level components just by using the integration by parts rule, right? If I were to just integrate in the other order, I, I already know what this sum is by using the first level, and this means that I already have too much information because I can rewrite them, some of these numbers in terms of the others. But in fact, there's another associated object which is called the log signature, which provides a fully compressed representation of it. So it's minimal. There, there are no relations between the numbers you compute. Okay, and here I'm using the word log, which uh, hints at some kind of exponential, which I will explain in a few seconds. And uh, another thing is that the first few levels of this signature map have a clear geometrical interpretation. So they can be, for example, uh, the increment of the curve, so the, the displacement, uh, the second level is an area and, uh, and so forth. Right. So in practice, you are only given uh, discrete data. And all I did before was really assuming that you had a continuous time curve because you were integrating and everything. So what you do is that you linearly interpolate these values. This is what is usually done when you deal with the signatures. So you have a set of points which are representing your data and you need to build a continuous time path out, out of it. And what it's classically done is that you just uh, form this path uh, little x as by just linearly interpolating the values. Uh, the nice thing is that in this case, these iterated integrals appearing in the definition of the signature are actually explicit to compute. You can compute them by hand, so you don't really need any numerical integration methods because if you want to know the components associated to some multi-index, there's an explicit formula and you, it's just a polynomial in the uh, entries of your, or in the components of your path. So moreover, in the simple case where your path is just a straight line, S of X is actually a exponential of some sort. Uh, and this object is living in the tensor algebra over RD, if you know what that means. So one advantage of this representation is that uh, since uh, if I truncate at a certain level, I have a fixed number of multi-indices, then the size of this signature representation doesn't depend on the number of samples. So I could have a million or 10 million samples, and when I compute the signature, I project it to a finite dimensional space of fixed dimension, no matter how, many how large this big N there is. So it's really space efficient. Right? You can actually know from the beginning, how much space do you need to compute this? And once you compute the signature, uh, you can essentially throw away your, your original path. So there's no need to store it. Just, it's a fixed uh, amount of numbers you need to compute, and it's the same independent of n. And the same holds for the log signature. Good. So this was for curves in RD. Right, but now we're dealing with curves in a Lie group. So what do you do? How do you proceed in this case? And uh, when you have a curve in a Lie group, what you do is that you pull it to the Lie algebra by using this uh, right logarithmic derivative. You point by point, you compute the derivative and you have a path now in the Lie algebra, which is what I've written in the second definition. So if you have a curve having uh, values in a Lie group, you define the signature as the signature, as I introduced before, of this particular path, which is only taking the path, looking at its derivative, and pulling it back to the Lie algebra, which is uh, what this omega map does. So if you have a d-dimensional Lie group, 
uh, it's uh, Lie algebra, it's uh, essentially RD, and you have a curve in RD. Right. So just uh, a br uh, one second comment. You, you know that the signature is actually the time one flow map of so a certain non-commutative differential equation controlled by X. So you have this diagram which tells you that uh, essentially S of X is uh, some sort of Lie group exponential, infinite dimensional Lie group exponential. Right, uh, so, uh, but I don't want to go into this, so I just briefly mention. So what, you what do you do for SO3, which is our case, is, okay, you have a set of snapshots, uh, snapshots of your motion, and then you do geodesic interpolation, which is this alpha T here. And what this is doing is essentially doing linear interpolation in the group, right? You, you have a set of matrices and then you geodesically interpolate between them. And this is exactly corresponds to the linear interpolation I showed you before. And this allows you to compute the signature in an easy way, which is what I written here, that essentially the Maurika transform in each of the interpolation intervals is constant. So again, no need for numerical integration or anything. It's fast to compute. And then, uh, you use this kind of feature map, which is the signature, so it's computing numbers out of your curves to compare this curve. S and here you have several choices. For example, you can uh, use a metric inherited from the tensor algebra, so these are only huge vectors, and you can put a norm on these vectors and compare them in this way. You can use an ad hoc uh, metric for signatures, which is which has been used in the li literature where here y tilde is just the, the same animation run backwards, so you invert the time. Or you can also compare log signatures with it, which are essentially uh, vectors in, in some Euclidean space. And we compare uh, our method with the methods ba based on the SRV thing. So I don't know if you can see, but this is uh, something called the multidimensional uh, scaling of the distance matrix uh, we computed using the signature for some particular choice of, of a norm and you see that you more or less see these clusters appear right so you have a cluster of running animations a cluster of jumping animation a cluster of walking animation but you have this run which is kind of close to the walk so which is n not quite as good and if if you compare this with the uh, with the graph obtained by the SRVT dynamic programming method, uh, you see the, the cl clusters are mu much tighter. Right, so this can be due to the choice of norm. Uh, there's some choices to be made. And we're still experimenting with that. Right, so, and as a final thing, I want to show you an example where, where I take two animations and I do geodesic interpolation uh, in the sense of uh, this uh, weak uh, Riemannian metric. So you really interpret both animations and you look uh, how this uh, signature, uh, signature metric behaves by differ uh, for different choice of choices of norm. Uh, right, and then just since DS, so this distance I showed you before uh, obtained as the infimum over all reparametrizations is actually the geodesic distance you see a straight line, right, when S goes from zero to one, because you're actually following the geodesic. So here are some things uh, that you can uh, compute. So this row two and row three are some metrics which uh, go to the third level and second level of the signature and you see they behave like this, which is not very good. Then you can try another metric and you see it behaves a little bit better, uh, but still not quite as good. And then finally you can build kind of this normalized uh, metric where you, you put some coefficients in front of the signature, and you see a much better behavior. So questions, just to finish, uh, how do you pull back this metric you put on signatures uh, to the shapes? Right, this is what I was showing you before. You have uh, multiple choices of metrics that you can use to compare this uh, feature, and uh, what does this mean for curves, for example? This is one thing. So. Again, you have uh, various choices of norms that you can use to compare these uh, feature sets that you compute out of your pads, and uh, they depend on the underlying norm, and you, you, you 
might want to have some quantitative uh, notion of how it depends on these norms. And probably you can you also use weighted uh, L2 norms with uh, learned weight. You can run this to a neural network and try to pinpoint the, better, the best weight to put in this norm for your particular example, for example. And also clarification of the geometrical interpretation of the signature in the, as in this diagram I showed you briefly. 